Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you all for joining. My name is Nagaraj. Uh, this is, meeting has been organized by the Teachers Against the Climate Crisis, which is roughly a one-year-old organization uh, comprising about 80 teachers and others uh, in universities sort of across the country. I should say that we are an autonomous organization, autonomous in two ways. One is we are non-funded. And secondly, we are not affiliated to any particular political party. So the broad aims of the teachers group is to essentially deepen engagement among different facets of the climate crisis among teachers and also among students and also sort of encourage students to look at issues in a kind of defragmented and unfragmented manner. Uh, we have a number of subgroups, uh, some of which are, are active, particularly the one around Delhi's reducing Delhi's emissions, one around building online resources, which will have material, basic material, syllabi, et cetera. In addition to that, before the lockdown, we had started having meetings in colleges around the climate crisis. And of course, since then, it's all gone online. And today is the 17th such talk in our series. And I would like to very much thank Dr. Sharad Chandra Lele for agreeing to speak today on framing climate change within a broader environmentalism. And also thank Professor Rajeshwari Raina for agreeing to conduct today's discussion. So let me just, pop, before I pass it on to Professor Raina, let me just say that the format is that Sharad will speak for about 40 and 45 minutes, after which you're encouraged to add in your comments and questions in the chat box. And if you wish to convey it verbally, you could also do so. Thank you very much once again for joining in. And over to you, Rajeshwari. Thank you. Thanks, Nagaraj. Um, yeah, so um, this is um, my audible. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, you are. Warm welcome to, to um, Sharad Chandralele, who's a professor at the A3 Ashoka Trust for Ecology and Environment. Um, Sharad's work is something that, that I'll talk about in a moment, but we must say that a lot of us who've come into the environmental well questions um, are people who've, who've interacted with Sharad and learned from him one way or the other during our, our well, uh, learning years and still going on. Now, um, for, for many of us, um, well, uh, knowing that Sharad com comes from an electrical engineering background, um, you know, was a bit of a shock because he really speaks the language of the environment. And um, also, um, you know, many of us who've been exposed to the to the, to the center that, that when he set up this, this first this center for uh, um, interdisciplinary studies in, on, in environment and development, science said, which was um, located in the ISIC campus, Institute of Social and Economic Change campus in Bangalore. Um, those of us who were there at the inaugural seminar um, were also um, amazed at the way in which that, that inaugural um, seminar was organized. Um, there was something about the big divide between, between the environment and, and knowledge, between the, the bigger divide between the natural sciences and the social sciences, and the biggest divide between the social sciences and economics, um, that is between other social sciences and economics. You know? So these are still the problems that we face. Sciset, of course, was way, way ahead of its time. Um, and uh, we all know that, that, that even today, I mean, as, um, well, as president of the Society of Ecological Economics, um, as an, an eminent author and people, person who's published and also led several of us in, in our research directions, um, Sharad's influence in environment and development thinking has been, has been really outstanding. Um, I don't have to say anything about that. Uh, for us as teachers um, in, this, in this small group, as Nagaraj said, autonomous, um, the, the request um, for this lecture comes from one at a side alarm, but also um, to see how we can teach, um, that is, how can we teach the, the, the next generation, um, next generations, hopefully, uh, to think differently about environment and development. And um, well, many of these blinkers that we've all grown up with, um, with in, which in many ways Sherrod has helped to, <laughs> to relieve and uh, to open up. Um, I'll stop now and um, invite you to deliver the lecture, Sherrod. 40 minutes is the time we have. So here we are with this lecture on uh, framing climate change with a broader environmentalism. Thank you, Sharad. Welcome again. Thank you, Raji. As always, you've been uh, much more generous than uh, accurate, maybe, in terms of uh, <laughs> both my abilities and contributions. Uh, 
but it's a real pleasure to be uh, here as part of this group. Um, it's also a challenge actually, because uh, this group that Nagaraj and others have uh, launched in a sense, uh, represents some of the best thinkers on climate change uh, in India, I think. And uh, one of the biggest challenges in terms of preparing a talk or a presentation for this group is knowing where to pitch it. So I have a feeling that I'm going to fall between multiple stools. There are going to be people here who are going to sort of roll their eyes at what I'm saying and say, oh, this is all old hat, which is most likely it is for them. Uh, and there are others who might find it still a little too complicated uh, given the shortage of time. Uh, but I hope people will bear with me and then we can engage more with some of these questions in the uh, discussion. So I'm really trying to uh, make this not as a lecture to a, a group of people, uh, more like a sharing of my own, uh, ev the evolution of my own thinking about climate change and how to engage or not engage with it uh, over the last maybe 10, 15 years or, or more. Um, let me just make sure that the slides are moving. So what I'm going to basically do is talk a little bit about how we frame climate change as the mother of all environmental problems. This is a fairly common uh, term that has been used uh, in the popular literature particularly. Um, and the limitations of that uh, framing takes us to sort of thinking about environmentalism in general, not just climate change, as a broader problem covering multiple normative concerns and also multiple analytical frameworks of uh, you know how, why we have these problems, what might be some of the solutions. And I'm going to use that to then uh, talk about a couple of case studies and I'm going to see how the time goes and I might actually switch the sequence, uh, do the water case study first. Uh, and then if time permits, uh, talk a little bit about forests um, from the adaptation in the case of water and the mitigation perspective in the case of uh, forests. So let me just begin with this cartoon, which I think in different ways, all of us have seen these kinds of uh, popular ways of uh, flagging concern about climate change and basically saying that the earth is uh, getting warmer and warmer and uh, uh, mother nature is really concerned about that. So this in this framing, we see uh, the whole sphere as in a sense, one suffering the problem of climate change and and stumbling or or uh, trying to figure out a way a way forward, maybe by go, going uh, going closer to Mother Nature in some sense um, for a solution. Uh, and I think this this framing of climate change as a, the mother of all problems, as a global problem, and therefore we are all in the same boat, uh, has been perhaps a very compelling framing, particularly in the global north but also has obviously percolated or maybe swamped the Global South in, ma in many ways, because uh, let's face it, a lot of the funding comes tied to this kind of a framing in some sense. And if one were to ask, uh, what is the underlying concern? So why are we really worried about climate change? In this framing, the concern is that the future is going to be much worse than the present if we don't do something about climate change. So it's the framing, the underlying ethical concern is about sustainability. How do we ensure that we, that our own future and future generations that will follow will not be faced with a completely, let's say, uh, dysfunctional global ecosystem, uh, uh, the consequence of runaway climate change, maybe four degrees of warming and so on and so forth. So uh, it's really about intertemporal impacts of human action. And the analytical position then is that these intertemporal impacts are caused by the tragedy of commons applied to the global atmosphere. Uh, the idea that <clears throat> everybody can emit uh, uh, CO2 with consequences are faced by everybody else, uh, not just by the individual who emits. And therefore we cannot solve the climate problem unless we collect have some kind of a collective agreement on uh, how to cut back uh, on our emissions. And so this, this framing of the uh, global atmosphere, you know, the climate change problems as a, as a global commons problem is a very compelling one. I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious that a ton of CO2 emitted anywhere in the world has roughly similar impacts. Uh, doesn't, because we, ca we cannot differentiate between different tons of CO2 emits, emitted in different parts of the world because the global uh, atmosphere is a well-mixed system. <clears throat> and therefore we all need to worry about our emissions. We all need to cut back we all need to contribute to solving the problem. Um, 
the an alternative framing that again most of you in the uh, you know uh, in today's uh, audience or in today's conversation would be familiar with is that uh, you know that was made popular by this very uh, influential uh, piece of work where the framing focuses on this this gross inequity or injustice in the way we are approaching the climate problem and it, he says yo amigo we need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect and of course developed countries uh, the car that is representing developed countries completely oblivious to the, their own uh, fossil fuel based emissions while worrying about deforestation in the amazon or in the himalayas or or somewhere else or indonesia so really calling it a, a case of environmental colonialism and this was the, a very seminal contribution by anil agarwal and sunita narayan uh, global warming in an unequal world uh, which uh, set the tone for what one might call a climate justice position that has certainly been used by the indian government and many of many of us in international climate negotiations and the climate justice position basically says we didn't create the problem and we really can't do much to solve it either because our historical contribution in terms of what we have contributed is barely 2% uh, and we may be the fourth largest emitter today but we are still only contributing um, you know 5% or today maybe 6% and so if you want to look at these numbers slightly out of date these are 2004 numbers but not really any dramatic change since then so on the left the leftmost bar is is cumulative emissions and you can see the indian contributions sitting over here and even china is still relatively small in the in the measure of cumulative co contributions although i suspect if you updated this to 2020 the chinese contribution would have expanded a little bit um and the the last two uh, uh, pieces are the eu and the us so they are still more than 50% of the historical contribution coming from just the eu and the us um even in terms of the current flux of emissions india is still pretty small that's that 5% figure which is now maybe at around 6% um chinese contribution is much bigger and and rise has been rising for a while uh and then you look at some of the other aspects such as economic growth and 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 population uh, you know the size of the population and so on so uh, the point being that again we did not contribute to the problem uh, uh, we didn't create the problem and even today our contribution is pretty small uh, so that if if we were to completely shut off uh, our emissions and and uh, uh, face a lot of deprivation a little bit like if india went into lockdown unilaterally the way we did uh, during covid 19 we would face enormous hardship but it would have a barely discernible impact i mean on on the global climate problem or maybe not at all uh, and of course if we engage with uh, the issue of you know let's all cut back on uh, our emissions what it does is legalize the squatter rights of the global north and again the sli slightly outdated uh, per capita emissions graph but not no, no, not a real big change from 2004 to 2020 in terms of the difference between the us eu on the one hand and india on the other hand sitting at around 2 tons per capita per year uh, so sort of way down there in terms of per capita uh, responsibility for even current emissions right so what we are doing if we engage in the the discussion on mitigation is sort of inevitably legalizing squatter rights for the global north because the global north refuses to look at historic emissions it uh, only looks at uh, aggregate emissions does not want to engage on a per capita basis even for current emissions um, and uh, even after all that i mean if you come to paris and you basically drop the idea of any kind of negotiated agreement on uh, cutbacks and only talking about sort of nationally determined contributions from which then finally the us anyway backs out so uh, you know we we bend over backwards to accommodate various uh, uh, concerns and then what we get is basically uh, a partial agreement which from which the us has backed out anyway uh, so this this climate justice position which sort of says that the the climate problem is really a problem of environmental justice a problem created by someone else the costs of which are being faced by the global south which has not contributed to creating the problem so it's sort of a unidirectional flow of of costs from a polluter to a pollute um, <clears throat> and therefore to look at the global south for solutions or for cutbacks is really uh, extremely unfair uh, and you can expand this or rather this this framing comes from the idea of environmental justice in general uh, where the normative concern in some sense is environmental and social justice 
and i'll come back to this so sort of the wording environmental and social justice in a minute um <clears throat> and the analytical position as to the nature of the biophysical problem sort of highlights the unidirectional nature of pollution so it says that even though the globe uh, so in a normal context say for example a river pollution case it's fairly obvious that if somebody upstream is dumping pollutants in the river somebody downstream downstream is drinking polluted water the problem is very clearly unidirectional from upstream to downstream now uh, we just said that the global climate system is a well mixed system so there shouldn't have been this unidirectionality but the reality is that even in terms even in the climate change context uh, the impacts are going to be faced in very different ways in different places and simply by by their location itself coastal communities will face bigger impacts let's say than people in the interior uh, the tropics will face much bigger impacts as compared to say temperate regions so for instance the russians and the canadians are really not hugely bothered about climate change because if it's going to there might even be positive benefits from opening up the siberian uh, you know permafrost to exploration uh, and a variety of other ways of using the landscape which they weren't able to use uh, in the earlier context so uh, there is really uh, not an equal distribution of the costs in fact there is a certain amount of unidirectionality and the analytical position sort of focuses on that saying we didn't create the problem you guys created the problem we are facing the consequences uh, we are facing bigger consequences perhaps than the global north because the global north is is basically also the temperate north uh, to a large extent um, and the reason why you are able to get away with imposing these this unequal distribution of benefits and costs uh, the explanation lies in the political economy uh, the power of the polluter to impose costs on the pollute and get away with it uh, and as i said this applies to pollution in general the question of you know somebody gains and somebody loses and can also be extended to the idea of resource access so some people get access to resources and others are deprived of that access it could be water it could be minerals it could be forests a uh, variety of other environmental resources so uh, this idea of environmental justice or this framing of environmental problems as environmental justice problems um is a very powerful framing framing and i think as I said, as the agarwal and narayan work and all subsequent sort of uh, work on climate justice shows one simply cannot talk about climate change without looking at the dimension of justice and that's that's a fairly obvious uh, i think uh, perspective coming from the global south sitting where we are in india it's really really uh, ridiculous to talk about climate change without talking about the justice dimension of climate change uh, but there are a few limitations at the same time of the justice framing and not just again for climate change but even in general about uh, environmental problems uh, clearly if we only focus on the justice question we are ignoring the intertemporal concern the fact that actions today will affect everybody tomorrow no uh, and it's more of an the intertemporal dimension is kind of fudged or 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 lost in the story the question of information do we did we really know say 30 years ago or 50 years ago when we were also uh, you know we had begun our coal coal mining process maybe 100 years ago and today are heavily dependent on dependent on coal as a source of energy did we really know in the 1950s when we launched on coal mining in a big way post independence that we would be causing uh, this problem and if we didn't then how come we can how come we are only talking about this north south justice uh, or that the north is responsible when perhaps even they didn't know that there was a climate change problem uh, uh, through fossil fuel burning uh, and the question of collective action so the idea that environmental problems are also problems of collective action uh, the uh, tragedy of the commons and are we saying simply that the polluter has the capacity to impose costs on the polluter uh, in a sort of unidirectional externality or are we really all part of the story are we all emitting uh, uh, you know uh, co2 today certainly as a upper middle class <coughs> indian my footprint is likely to be more like 4 and 5 tons per capita per year certainly not at the indian national average of 2 maybe even more and the fact that we don't really know our our carbon footprint very well is part of the story uh, that i'll come back to in a minute uh, but certainly we are part of the problem and therefore we the collective action framing does not disappear just because we talk about the inequity or the injustice uh, part of the story the other challenge for the uh, justice framing is while justice is an important concern it does not tell us uh, what is it that we want to equitably distribute what kind of life do we want to have equitably distributed and this 
uh, criticism comes very strongly from the conservation uh, groups who would say, do you want to share equitably a an, an earth that's bereft of all, for instance, all animals, all, all wildlife, all pristine nature? Um, or do you really want to also talk about uh, preserving some part of that non-human uh, side of, uh, of the earth, which justice argument doesn't very clearly uh, or easily uh, address? Um, so from this uh, description, I think you can also already see what I'm getting at is that really when we think about environmentalism, do we have to be limited to thinking in only this or only that uh, framework? That is only a sustainability framework or only an environmental justice framework. I think a lot of us will agree that these are perhaps the two dominant frameworks in the environmental discourse. And certainly in the climate context, they have been at loggerheads for a, for a long time. Uh, is the climate change problem a sustainability problem or is it uh, a justice problem? And we seem to get really caught in that kind of a dichotomous framing and forget that environmentalism is actually a, a broader concept. It has multiple normative concerns that underpin uh, the idea of environmentalism. And it has multiple analytical uh, positions or analytical uh, uh, takes on why we have those environmental problems. And I don't think we need to be uh, trapped in this kind of a uh, binary or, or uh, either or kind of situation where we can only explain or uh, frame environmental problems in a particular way. Uh, so I would actually propose, and I've in the paper that was circulated uh, earlier and, and earlier writings that I've been involved in, I've been kind of pushing for thinking about environmentalism as having multiple uh, normative ideas embedded in it, uh, which are not reducible to a single idea, and also multiple explanations that are again not reducible to a single explanation. So the idea of sustainability, or maybe in the in the context of climate change, we don't even know what, what, what sustainability means really, because we have no clear idea of what the future will bring. So a lot of the uh, language in the climate context has shifted from sustainable climate to a resilient climate, or rather, sorry, resilience to climate change, uh, because it's not a it's not a secular trend of global warming. So you can see, for example, the shift in the debate from global warming to climate change uh, is partly a shift in our scientific understanding from simply talking about the impacts of rising temperatures, sort of as a unidirectional impact of declining well declining well being as temperature rises, to talking about climate change as being basically that you know, characterized by greater uncertainty, greater fluctuation, more extreme events. And one may sort of get into the politics of, you know, whether this is a, you know, this shift is really fully justified. The unidirectionality or shall we say the secular increase in temperature is what's going to, for example, lead to the melting of the Himalayan glaciers. That's not an uncertainty there, or it's not some kind of a, uh, an extreme event which will come and go, or this year you have glaciers and the next year you don't have glaciers and the year again you have glaciers. That's not what's going to happen. That's a, a secular trend in terms of melting of the ice. Uh, the Arctic ice melting or the Antarctic ice melting, these are secular trends. Uh, ocean levels rising, these are secular trends. Some of the other effects like droughts and floods are about uh, you know more extremes. So uh, the language has been more about resilience, but whether it's a, a sustainability framing or a resilience framing, it's really talking about intertemporal effects. The fact that our actions today are going to put us in a more uncomfortable world tomorrow or a more uncertain world tomorrow. Um, we have, of course, the, the justice framing. And here I'd like to clarify the idea, what I've, I've tried to argue for our own sake or clarity, a difference between environmental justice and social justice. And mind you, I say this while acknowledging that the term environmental justice originated in the US in a very different sense. But I feel that in our discussion of justice around environmental problems, it's useful to separate uh, the injustice caused by the upstream downstream nature of many environmental problems. The fact that I can pollute a river and I don't have to drink that water because the, what, the river is taking that water downstream. So I keep getting clean water from upstream and my pollution goes downstream. And all the cities, you know, whether it's the Delhi on the banks of the Yamuna or Bangalore on the banks of the Brishwavati or whatever are involved, engaged in this kind of a uh, upstream polluter uh, activity uh, uh, affecting livelihoods of people or the fate of uh, ecosystems downstream. Um, so that's the environmental injustice in some sense. But there is an additional element of social justice that we should be thinking about. 
and they may or may not coincide. So you might have the downstream affected person being poor and the upstream polluter being rich. You might also have the upstream polluter being poor and the downstream uh, affected person being rich. Uh, both of these, in my opinion, are, should be thought of as environmental injustice problems. Uh, but the social justice questions need to be added to that and or integrated with that in whatever fashion that they, they occur. And it could be economically economic injustice, it could be gender, it could be caste, it could be race, a variety of dimensions of the social justice problem that need to be overlaid on the environmental justice. Usually they will they might go hand in hand because the capacity to impose environmental harm often correlates with the capacity to uh, the power that comes from you know either class or or caste or something else. But they might also not uh, correlate. Um, and the idea of conservation, and you can think of it as conservation. You can think of animal rights. You can think of love for nature. Sort of essentially capturing a dimension which is not about intertemporal. It's not really interpersonal. It's really about our behavior towards uh, non-human, non-humans. How should we re uh, re relate to non-humans? And uh, a point that I used to say: in this, the first three are environmentalism, but we need to go beyond environmentalism. Uh, thanks to Amitabh Bhavishkar's writing on the idea of environmentalism, I've kind of come around to the proposition that even the idea of development or material well-being is really also a part of environmentalism. Why is my demand for a minimum amount of water uh, in an accessible or affordable form, not an environmental problem, is what how Amita posed it in her uh, in her essay in our book. That's also an environmental problem because water is an environmental resource, and therefore my demand for a, a certain material quality of life is an environmental demand in some sense. It's not. It could be framed as a developmental demand, but it's actually part of the uh, environmental problem in some sense. And finally, the idea of procedural justice, because we will never have agreement on. Uh, all of these dimensions, these concerns, uh, uh, we will always have different takes, different priorities, different ways of defining justice or conservation, animal rights, or sustainability, different understandings of the implications of, of uh, our actions on these dimensions. And therefore, we will need some procedures for, uh, as a society, for uh, deciding on what, how to proceed. And the question, therefore, of procedural justice or democracy, that we cannot have procedures that are oppressive and hope to find answers that are progressive in some sense. We will have to also have very progressive procedures because we are still operating in a world that is both complicated and significantly unknown. Um, so this idea of a broader uh, environmentalism, this, this part of it is about uh, a framing which has multiple normative concerns, uh, but it also therefore requires us to embrace multiple explanations. And the way I try to uh, sort of depict that is this slightly, we shall we say, uh, simplified diagram, where I've, I would argue that environmental and development problems certainly are at the top. You will see the political economy of, of resource access or pollution. Um, the fact that somebody can impose harm on somebody else or somebody can preferentially grab a resource uh, without uh, uh, taking into consideration claims of others is an issue of political economy. Uh, and this I mean by political economy. Here I mean mostly issues of class, but we can add questions of social discrimination, whether it's gender or caste or ethnicity, uh, as also being responsible for these environment and development problems. Um, and the issue of how we politically govern ourselves uh, and the failure of democracy in some sense, uh, which you might say is actually part of the issue of imperfect markets or the failure of the economic arrangements that we have uh, in our society. but also flagging these two other explanations, the question of, of uh, uh, science and technology. Is, it, is one of the reasons that we are in the situation that we are, whether it's about the overuse of fossil fuels or any of the other environmental problems, for instance, groundwater pumping, um, simply a, a result of the political economy or the failure of democracy, social discrimination, is it also possibly uh, partly related to a reductionist science? that prevents us from seeing the implications of, of our actions or technologies which have been tilted towards a certain kind of outcome, big dams, uh, for example, a lot of technology about groundwater pumping, but almost no technology for monitoring the impacts of groundwater pumping. Um, and finally, the question of values, that can we really only have structural explanations for our predicament? Do we also have to look inwards in terms of our uh, value systems? Yes, the structures, influence the value system, but can we 
uh, say that the, the value system is completely a product of structure or do we have to give it some independent standing? And I'm kind of propose, proposing this uh, idea of uh, multiple semi-independent uh, explanations for an, uh, these problems. They are also interconnected, but they also have some independent standing. Um, so if we come back now to the question of climate change, you might say, well, there are some, you know, forget all this theory, forget all this, you know, big talk about uh, why, uh, why we care about climate change. There are some very pressing pragmatic reasons why we should engage with climate change. Um, if we didn't have a meaningful treaty, uh, we would have massive impacts. And uh, as somebody living in the global south or people living in the global south with lesser capacity to adapt, less space to adapt, less resources to use for adaptation, uh, and huge impacts, whether it's glacier meltdown, sea level rise, uh, more storms uh, and droughts. Uh, in the Indian context, if really some of the predictions come true, you might even have a shutdown of the monsoon cycle, uh, in which case the impact would be disproportionately large. It's a little bit like the idea of a shutdown of the, of the Gulf Stream, um, which could have a disproportionate impact on, on Europe. And that's really one of the reasons why I think you see uh, uh, a greater concern in, in Europe for, for uh, climate change as compared to us. Um, sorry, so as compared to the US. Um, also, if you had a very unequal treaty, uh, then our developmental space would be stifled. That's why we need to engage in international negotiations. And of course, the most pragmatic reason of all that currently work on environment seems to be equated to work on climate change. Almost nothing is funded if you don't uh, tie it to climate change. Maybe now in the post COVID-19 context, it will become climate change and COVID or maybe just pandemics or something like that is the new buzzword for, for funding. Uh, I hope I hope not, but it's possible. Uh, but these are really pragmatic reasons for maybe engaging with the climate change question. There are obviously also principled reasons why uh, people in India, people in the global south should continue to engage with the climate change question. And one of the reasons, even though we didn't create it, we, uh, and our contribution even today is really small, uh, we are being cornered in international negotiations in ways that are really not fair. Nevertheless, uh, at one level, the climate change uh, question uh, sort of makes us confront the conventional developmental paradigm head on. So it highlights the real problem of the developmental paradigm, which is that it's an entirely fossil based uh, paradigm. And it gives us a sort of an entry point in the form of, of a carbon footprint uh, into uh, the idea of who's really responsible for the environmental crisis by using carbon footprints as a way of slicing the problem which we didn't have so far. We were talking about, oh, well, somebody lives in uh, Punjab and maybe is using, uh, consuming high yielding varieties of rice, uh, which have some uh, issues of pesticide and fertilizers, blah, blah, blah. Somebody else living somewhere else has, is creating different kinds of environmental problems. But in a sense, the carbon footprint measure is a universal measure that uh, can be used to talk about the environmental impact of different lifestyles. And connected to that in some sense, uh, climate change, I think, brings home the point the, from these two issues, uh, the point about separation of production and consumption. Whereas in an earlier context, the farmer who maybe cut down too many trees uh, and therefore lost access to the forest uh, paid the price of, uh, uh, or at least there maybe the future generations play, paid the price of uh, deforestation. Uh, modernity, modern industrial uh, technology, particularly fossil fuels, but also the larger sort of the, the growth of the modern industrial complex means that production and consumption are hugely separated. So my consumption behavior does not have necessarily only local consequences. It could be having consequences really far away in terms of the wood coming from, the, uh, from Indonesia or uh, petroleum coming from somewhere else, um, minerals in my cell phone coming from somewhere else, my, the embedded footprint of my uh, food consumption coming from uh, say the Indo-Gangetic plain, even though I live in Bangalore and stuff like that. So uh, it really highlights the separation of production and consumption. Uh, I want to, however, point out that when we looked at this problem of, of consumption from multiple perspectives, so what uh, one of my PhD students, Somijit Bhar, just submitted his PhD, where he's really tried to look at this question of how does the carbon footprint differ from, say, a water footprint or an air pollution footprint in terms of uh, its distribution across class. It's really interesting to look at that. 
So here is the water footprint uh, along the income decile. So on the right hand side of the graph, you have the top. It's uh, it's the 10 percent percentiles uh, graph. So at the top, the top 10 percentile in terms of income on the rightmost end of the graph. And in yeah, I mean it's intuitive to say that the water footprint keeps rising uh, as you go from the poorest to the richest. But as you'll notice, the the rise is roughly twice. Uh, it doubles, sort of, from 600 to 1200 or thereabouts. And even in the topmost decile, the biggest contribution of uh, uh, to the water footprint is coming from food, and not really from uh, conspicuous consumption in the form of air travel, uh, sort of vacations in uh, Bangkok or vacations in Europe, um, or other kinds of uh, conspicuous consumption, which he has put in the gray box. Uh, so food, non-food, and and conspicuous consumption is what he is kind of tried to sort out the consumption basket uh, using whatever data we had from the IHDS survey. Uh, when you go to the next uh, footprint, which is the air pollution footprint, you see a bigger rise from one to 3.3, 3.5. And as you can see, the gray uh, contribution in, in the last decile is, is really very significant. So the air pollution contribution rises dramatically when you go to the highest consuming bracket of society. In India, this is uh, for India, uh, and so does the uh, carbon footprint. Uh, the carbon footprint is is a little bit fuzzier in terms of the contribution of of uh, conspicuous consumption because a lot of non-food consumption also has a very high carbon footprint. Uh, but here it goes from below two to close to five, so factor of two and a half and so on. So as you can see, the the rise is much more rapid in the case of uh, Air pollution and carbon footprint. You might say it's actually uh, higher for the for air pollution in terms of the ratio between the poorest and the richest. It's also interesting that the food consumption really doesn't vary that much. Um, sorry, the water footprint of of consumption doesn't vary that much, and most of it is coming from food. So it's not surprising because food is the biggest uh, agricultural sector is the biggest contributor to water footprint, and really there's not a huge difference between the consumption by the poorest and the consumption by the rich in terms of uh, they the kind you know the the food that they are eating. You can only eat so much food during one day. So uh, and it can it's even possible. And I think there's a hint of that in the lowest decile that the poorest uh, uh, class maybe actually uh, because of the PDS system be given a lot of rice, a lot of wheat, which has a higher footprint. And the richest class might now actually be shifting to sort of the more uh, fashionable millets and so on uh, that have uh, recently become popular. And therefore, they might be actually reducing their water footprint compared to the poorest class that are getting uh, basically very water intensive paddy and wheat uh, in their ration shops. So it just shows that this stuff is uh, very interesting to look at, that our, our consumption uh, footprints vary by the kind of footprint we are looking at. The impact of water consumption is not just for me in Bangalore, but you know, in the, my, my water consumption may be coming from uh, the Gangetic Plain because a lot of my food might be coming from there. Um, and the implications of that also vary by region. So groundwater pumping in Kolar for my fruit is different from the uh, use of, let's say, uh, floodwaters in, in uh, UP for growing uh, sugarcane or something. So uh, it might be quite different in different places. The air pollution footprint is right. Note that this is not really an air pollution footprint. It's a PM 2.5 uh, emission footprint. So it's much harder to convert that into impacts on, for example, human health because again, the regional circulation models are much more complicated uh, for air pollution. Uh, the carbon footprint is that much easier to interpret in terms of its, its impacts, perhaps. Uh, let me now quickly move to the, the case of water. Raji, do I have, do I have over 10 minutes? Um, yeah, another, another five to seven minutes. Sure, sure. So I'm just going to then cover the case of water. I'd like to look at the question of adaptation. How do we engage with the question of adaptation to climate change using the case of the water sector. And uh, for that, I'm going to switch uh, presentations here. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just making sure this is visible, Raji. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah, it is so, visible. So if you, if you look at the water sector and apply a multiple concerns framework, uh, the idea that we are not only talking about sustainability in the water context either. Uh, so you do, you, in the Indian context, probably the topmost concern is actually adequacy, not just for domestic consumption, but for multiple uses, uh, quality of water, uh, inequity in access to water. So different people having different levels of 
ability to satisfy their need of course the question of sustainability but most specifically in the context of groundwater so sustainability is not really a concern that you can apply sort of uh, indiscriminately to all water resources the question of resilience to climate change uh, and of course the question of democratic governance how do we take decisions about water so these are really the concerns that pop up in the water sector if you look at the literature as a whole again because of our tendency to think in boxes some literature will focus on water justice or water inequity the other on sustainability and so on and so forth uh, in the water sector the, the drivers of these problems are again multiple right uh, it's not just climate change it's everything change that's one way of looking at it that yes climate is changing and changing climate will change uh, water availability uh, in the water sector but everything else is also changing populations are changing demographics between the rural and urban are changing types of use domestic and agriculture versus industrial and commercial are changing um, technologies are changing uh, technological practices and agriculture are changing so a whole lot of things are changing simultaneously not just climate change um, as an aside i would like to also add in this uh, touches upon the point that raji made in her introduction uh, the question of how different academic disciplines Uh, look at the problem of water so hydrologists typically analyze at basin scales social scientists tend to focus on households and communities and talk about climate resilience uh, of households and communities but the link between what the hydrologists are doing at the basin scale and what the social scientists studying at perhaps the household scale is really happening through infrastructure and institutions about how water is transported from the basin to the household whether it's from by a canal by pipelines from the kaveri to bangalore or <clears throat> uh, by groundwater pumping uh, and then distribution so there is technology involved and there is uh, therefore huge infrastructure involved in many cases and there are institutions about who gets access to that pipeline water and who doesn't um, <clears throat> and so what we used for our, our work on uh, river basins urbanizing river basins in our case was to think about a conceptual framework uh, where the outcomes are multiple the issues of livelihood equity sustainability and democracy and then we looked at different factors and how they interconnect um, in terms of producing these these complicated outcomes and that includes the issue of wastewater that includes the issue of climate change potentially that includes of course the issue of land use change uh, that's driven by agricultural change uh, and we applied this framework to uh, understanding the problem in the in the context of bangalore and and coimbatore and i'm just going to give you a two slides or three slides of high level messages there's published stuff on this that i'll be happy to refer to you if you're really interested in the details uh, we looked at two basins one that overlaps with bangalore and the other that in which coimbatore city is located uh, and just to use the bangalore example so the river arkavathi flow, flows into a, a dam called pgrd dam and that dam was the main source of water for bangalore for a good four or five decades uh, and there's a very clear sort of you can say iconic evidence that there is a declining trend in the flow of the arkavathi river as measured at this dam the tgrd dam right very clear trend from the 40s to the 70s it's in fact rising that could just be sort of uh, year to year fluctuations in rainfall and then you have a clear decline after the uh, late 70s till basically today this dam does not supply any water to bangalore from an original capacity of 150 million liters per day so this has been used often as a sort of a climate story oh this is a result of climate change or it's used as a story to explain you know to uh, talk about whatever you think is the most important uh, driver of environmental change when we looked at this problem we explored the possibility of climate change as being a driver there's however been no reduction in rainfall uh, there's a very minor rise in temperature and that minor rise in temperature of half a degree does not translate into any significant impacts in terms of uh, water flows um, so the past climate is not really ex explaining the uh, decline so far it doesn't mean that there will not be future climate change that further complicates the story but certainly the past climate change is not explaining the the already observed decline um and what really explains the decline is a combination of agricultural pumping uh, and eucalyptus expansion so eucalyptus expanded from 0% of the landscape of, of the catchment of this dam in 1970s to 20% of the landscape of this uh, uh, dam which is the single biggest uh, crop in a sense in the landscape and that's a huge water guzzling crop 
uh, that that reduces water availability in the river because basically groundwater levels drop and then there's no no base flow. So eucalyptus expansion and additional agricultural pumping for crops to supply the city with vegetables and fruit has been the story of the primary driver of uh, declining flows in the Arkavati River tied to the declining levels of groundwater. The graph below is about the declining groundwater levels in the catchment. Uh, so one story therefore is about urbanization, not by itself causing changes in the hydrology, but urbanizing, uh, urbanization changes agriculture. Although overall cultivated area goes down, but the intensity of water use actually goes up as people demand vegetables and fruit rather than ragi and something else. Uh, therefore groundwater levels go down. Um, if we were able to hold uh, or limit extraction, the initial recovery might be actually very fast and might not require uh, co uh, coordination at the river basin scale. That's just the nature of the hydrogeology here. So uh, the question there is, the, uh, how do we limit pumping, reduce uh, the intensity of, of irrigation in some sense while keeping farmers in agriculture in a fair manner? Because the story right now is the richest farmers are still in agriculture as they're able to exploit groundwater even at a thousand feet. The poorer farmers have all quit agriculture and are working in the city uh, rather than cultivating rain fed ragi. So that's really the inequity problem cu coupled with the sustainability problem of declining groundwater levels. So how do we really solve this complex problem becomes the real question. Urbanization um, itself influences surface water and groundwater downstream of Bangalore. So imports coming from Kaveri, that which means you're depriving somebody else downstream of that water. Uh, groundwater levels in cities are actually going both up and down, up in the center and down in the periphery. But contamination levels are going up everywhere. Uh, the pollution mitigation can have double benefits, but there will be distributional issues about who benefits from uh, the uh, treated uh, wastewater uh, versus those who are getting that for free for, for the time being. So again, we need to step back from simplistic solutions such as talking about privatization of water supply, 24 bar seven as a solution, or even building big recycling plants and then exporting the water as is the case now, exporting the treated wastewater to some district far away again. Um, uh, and therefore the link with climate change in this whole story is really, really complicated. You could say past climate change has not been the driver of all, all that's happening uh, in this uh, basin. The climate will change. What we know of the likely uh, trends in climate might actually reduce uh, because we might see more, greater rainfall in the Bangalore area uh, under climate change. Uh, although it will reduce the area, the water rainfall in the Kaveri Basin. So it's going to be a complicated uh, set of impacts. Uh, all these impacts, whether they are climate change driven impacts or agriculture driven impacts or population driven impacts, et cetera, are filtered through pipelines, through the agency, through bore wells, and through the mostly missing laws and, and mostly missing science uh, on uh, what's happening to the water. So uh, when we talk about integrating climate change concerns in the water sector, we really need to ask, what would it actually mean? And this is going to be very, very place specific. I think the common thread everywhere is going to be that it's not just climate change, but everything change. And therefore, if you want to talk about uh, climate adaptation in the water sector, we really need to have this wider perspective that we are not only going to focus on resilience as the outcome or sustainability as the outcome in, with respect to climate change, we are all, if you talk, I, I use this phrase called vulnerability, which we hear a lot in the climate change literature, right? People, people talk about vulnerability to climate change and so on. But frankly, when you look at the water sector, there's a whole population that's already vulnerable. It's already below your uh, required uh, daily norm in terms of access to water. So if they're already below that daily norm, what are we talking about in terms of vulnerability? They're already uh, facing water poverty or water scarcity. And Climate change may aggravate it, may not aggravate it. it. It sort of sounds almost irrelevant. So we need to integrate our understanding of climate change with the very specific location specific uh, nature of the hydrology, the technology, the institutions, the demographics and so on to understand how climate change may or may not complicate matters uh, in the water sector in a particular context. So I would uh, close this case study by saying it's not about climate change, it's everything change. We need to be concerned about multiple things, not just resilience. And we should be thinking about multiple drivers of change, not just climate. And only then we might have some semblance of, shall we say, uh, an understanding of the problem and therefore uh, 
recommend solutions that are more holistic, more lo long lasting than otherwise. Uh, let me just wrap up this this point. I'm going to skip the uh, the uh, forest case study for lack of time. We might talk about it later on uh, if we want. Uh, and I just sort of summarize what I've been offering here that the framing of climate change as the mother of all environmental problems it hides the fact that we are already a vulnerable population. We have already we are already facing uh, multiple forms of environmental degradation, whether it is deforestation, groundwater declines. Uh, water pollution, air pollution, uh, you name it, is present in India in huge intensities, much before even climate change has manifested itself. So it's stifling because it ignores other uh, environmental problems. It's stifling because it forces us to focus on mitigation questions where we are not the biggest contributors. It's stifling because it's sort of saying that we are all in the same boat when we are not really in the same boat, uh, and so on. And in all these contexts, whether it is climate change, or whether it is the forest sector or the water sector or the energy sector, we really need to embrace a multidimensional environmentalism uh, where it's about multiple concerns. Uh, and I would include development as part of an environmental concern in some sense, uh, quality of life as part of an environmental concern and the quality could be both material and uh, spiritual. Um, and we need to have uh, a multi-causal sort of framework to understand to analyze these problems before we recommend solutions so that we just don't focus on uh, let's say the political economy or only the uh, commons problem or only the uh, market failure of you know and therefore the question of prices or only the question of uh, demographic change and so on so i think we really need to embrace this idea of uh, multiple explanations along with multiple concerns thank you Thank you, Shira. Thank you. That was a, a brilliant lecture. Um, we will have some questions. I will hold my, my questions for a while because <laughs> there are there are um, a couple of questions already. Shall I just start with the questions or would you like to read for yourself on the, in the chat box? Is no, please go ahead. I, I don't think I'll be able to. Okay, uh, there is a, a question from uh, from um, MB Ramana from um, why would, um, well, that, basically about the 24-7 the, the that you mentioned in your water case case study. So what does that have to do with solving the water problem? That's uh, one question. There's a response to that also on the chat box. But uh, Ramana's question continues about why would that be 24-7 uh, water problem, or let's say water supply, be a solution to the problem of a decline in water availability. Um, okay. So, so, um, so very, very quickly, Ramana. Too, so we'll get that after this, yeah. Okay. Please. So very quickly, yeah. Ramana, the uh, the reason why this 24 bar 7, uh, you could say it's a bit of a straw man, but unfortunately, uh, it pops up repeatedly in the discourse that the World Bank and other agencies have put, put forth in the water sector. And this is in the context of urban water problems. Uh, and the argument is that we have enough water, uh, but it's being wasted because of intermittent supply. Um, and frankly, the intermittent supply is just part of the story, but 24 bar 7, is a code word for three things, which is uh, continuous as against inter interrupted supply by a private distributor of water whose infrastructure, who gets infrastructure that has been created at state expense. So it's, a, it's just really a code word for privatization of distribution uh, combined with the, 20, the idea of 24 bar seven. So 24 bar seven is basically saying that people do not get good quality supply. Uh, it's not, it's an interrupted uh, supply Therefore, people overconsume because they store and then throw the water. Uh, people are not willing to pay for it because it's it's a lousy service. Um, if you privatize and give 24 bar 7, uh, the private uh, service provider will be efficient, charge the right price, and uh, you know provide water to everybody. So that's that's been sort of to, to put it very quickly. That's been the kind of story around 24 bar 7. It's a code word for privatizing uh, water water service delivery after having renovated the, the infrastructure at public expense. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sherwick has a question. Sherwick, are you, if you're online, would you just start asking? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Raj Shreti, for uh, giving me the opportunity. And uh, thank you, Professor Lele, for taking your time and giving this brilliant talk. We are a big fan of your writings and everything, and it's really a great honor to hear you. Uh, I have... Uh, one concern, and especially that uh, uh, at about uh, the beginning of the presentation of the climate justice and the international uh, aspect. And 
Um, my uh, understanding is that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the world post 2000 has changed a lot with India, China, even though uh, it, uh, that the emissions from these countries are contributing globally. Because if you look at uh, India's data, uh, in 2006, India's, uh, according to the World Bank, India used to uh, emit around 1.3 million kilotons. In 2016, just 10 years, it has almost doubled to 2.4 million kilotons of CO2 emissions, which is uh, in 10 years, which is like a huge increase. And, I, and of course, in per capita terms, one can argue that it is much lower than the advanced countries. And it is of course true. But, uh, and I believe that one of the reasons why it is ha happening, and correct me if I'm wrong, that India's uh, uh, reliance on coal has also like for electricity production has gone up dramatically over this period. It has gone up from almost 65% to almost 75%. Like it's using more coal every day to produce electricity. And I'm, all this data from the World Bank. And my question is that one of the narrative, of course, uh, in the alternative is that uh, uh, India needs to, uh, that there is uh, injustice, historical injustice, and one needs to take into account while doing this uh, framework. But uh, in the North, the narrative, which is led by President Trump and others, is that, see, uh, why should we do anything? We have India, China, they are all burning coal, and they are asking us not to burn coal. And I am giving this narrative, so they are climate change deniers, as we all know, but uh, they, have a, uh, uh, they have a very uh, strong uh, opinion now today about climate change that they actually uh, instigate the working class by saying all this, that say the developing countries are doing all this and they are telling us not to use coal. Won't you think that it would be a good idea if, uh, if not South in that sense, like the poorer countries and the uh, advanced countries both come together to come. I, I'm sorry. Priyanka, hello, hello. Priyanka, will you just mute yourself, please? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So, and like, show it a little fast, please. That's yes, uh, my, I, I ended my course. So I was just uh, asking, like, uh, would you think that it would be a better idea if this, all these countries are taking into account this narrative? Because I think, like you said, India can be very vulnerable to the uh, consequences of climate change, especially in the coastlines and other places. Thank yeah. you. This was my question. Thanks, Shavik. Uh, I think what you've highlighted is the kind of change in India's position. In some sense, the change in India's position uh, reflects the argument that you're making, right? So maybe till Copenhagen, the argument was very much of CBDR and that we are not responsible. Therefore, we should not take on any responsibility. Um, uh, for mitigation uh, and that the global north should do it. And clearly it's the pragmatics of the story. Uh, Navros, for example, has been pushing this idea that it's not just pragmatics, but maybe uh, it's a smart thing to do, to agree to take on some, uh, some commitments to kind of grease the wheels of international negotiations because the climate justice approach, according to him and many others, has paralyzed the international discussion and we have no agreement whatsoever. So the, the argument was, a bad agreement is, or an unjust agreement is better than no agreement. If an unjust agreement means the US does 20% reduction then they should be doing 70% cutbacks, are we still not better off? And that's a matter of free debate, both in terms of whether we prefer that outcome, where we take on you know, very burdensome commitments and uh, the US takes on 20% when it should be taking on 70% cutbacks, um, uh, whether that's something we, we agree with and whether the outcome is really, even in pragmatic terms, what we hoped it would be. And I think it was a plausible argument, but I've sort of come to the conclusion that when you look at the behavior of the US post Paris, which was Paris was all about voluntary commitments, getting rid of the la language of rights, getting rid of the language of justice, and simply saying, everybody do uh, you know, what best they can. And what is it, where, where has that left us? It's left us with the US pulling out even out of Paris, right? So they pulled out of Kyoto and they uh, pulled out of Paris. So it's like, even, even doing voluntary commitments, they don't want to do that. So I'm almost, I'm now convinced that we may have to go back to the language of rights because this voluntarism hasn't taken us anywhere. But I, your point about, you know, should we not take on more commitments? Well, it's sort of reflected in our position in Paris that yes, we are part of the problem, 
and we are doing our best without compromising completely our ability to develop so uh, i think from a, at least from a real politic or a pragmatic sense your arguments were taken on board where they have left us is i guess uh, a matter of debate Uh, there yeah. was also a related question, uh, Raji. If I can quickly yes, respond. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, there China, was one about the the Chi- Yeah, Chi- uh, Chi- China, which says now in the context of China, should we rethink the framing of international negotiation blocks? Yes, I mean BRICS, as in being uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. These are not homogeneous. It's not a homogeneous block by any means, right? So, are uh, are uh, tactically are are wanting to be part of this block. has its pros and cons and china being part of that block is one of the big cons in some sense um, <clears throat> it's still it's still amazing that a, uh, a chinese economy which if i am not mistaken uh, its uh, uh, production based footprint is about 9 uh, uh, consumption based footprint is about 7 so that you know that drop because a lot of that is uh, production for for export um, and yes in terms of absolute emissions you're talking about 29% of current emissions and therefore a growing share if you looked at historic emissions and so on and so forth but and, and at the end of that you're still talking about 8 and 9 when there are countries like the us sitting at 18 and 16 and importing the equivalent of an indian footprint um for you know if you add uh, imports to the us it becomes from 16 to 18 or aji uh, could i just come in half, so yeah uh, so i was just saying yes. that Uh, engaging with china as a brics is a tactical question and i agree that there are, there are uh, problems with that so i don't think it changes the the fundamental part of the story can i just come in sharad a minute please i'm i'm saying that given china's consumption levels of coal energy other commodities the size of its economy it's only economy in the world that's 14 trillion dollars and growing at 6% and what i'm saying is that the entire structure that is talked about <coughs> in this context of a global south and the global north needs to be rethought given what where china is right now and given the rate at which it's growing that's what i'm saying the basics is only an incidental question that india and china are clubbed together india and china are like different planets but my point is this concept of a global south ever since anil agarwal 30 years ago the entire framework and structure of a dual needs to be rethought in the climate both in the climate change and in the climate politics is the point i'm trying to make thanks fair enough Okay. Um. There's a question from Suhas. Um. This, um. About. Um. Well. The ways can I which... can I say it? It might yes. be easier. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Thank you, Rajeshwari. Uh. Thanks, Sharad Chandra Lele, for your talk. Uh. I would like to bring you from the international to the our local. Uh. Recently, our environmental minister, in spite of the climate crisis in the background, has given. coal licenses to private coal mining and uh, he is trying to waive off any environmental impact assessment and all in the name of doing business your comments on this please thank you uh well i think i think this points to the fact that again we need to have a broader engagement with the environmental question right so we could hammer him for being climate uh, insensitive you're increasing our use of coal that's being climate insensitive when he could come back and saying come back and say why are you asking us to be climate sensitive we are still at 2 tons per capita per year or whatever 2 and a half uh, so that that could go back and forth so unless we begin with a broader understanding of the you know what is the problem with coal and the problem with coal is not just that it's uh, it causes co2 emissions uh, but also that it destroys local livelihoods it destroys forests it destroys adivasi habitat it uh, hugely inequitable or unfair ways in which he is an environment minister so he is supposed to have this understanding of environment I, and livelihood I, i i agree but the fact that he doesn't the fact that he doesn't um is just a reflection of of the the times that we live in right and the particular dispensation that we have uh currently in power but as you know there's a fair bit of continuity in between the upa and the bjp governments as far as environmental policies are concerned specifically on uh, issues of coal and so on and so forth there was huge tussle going on even when jairam ramesh was the minister about what areas will be opened up for coal and what won't be opened up for coal and his desperate attempts to create no go areas were over time sort of diluted by upa itself before this dispensation dispensation came in so uh, in some ways i think uh, this challenges us to ask the question uh, how are all of us visualizing development 
I mean, can we? I mean, as as somebody who lives in Bangalore, uh, what fraction of my electricity consumption comes from Raichur Thermal Power Plant? And and Raichur Thermal Power Plant is basically fed by coal mines from Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, right? So uh, I'm part of the problem, is what I'm saying. I'm. It's not only about whether that coal is coming from a private mine or a public sector mine. Yeah, that's uh, mm-hmm. that has some implications. But it's about coal mining itself. uh and and the fact that i as a an upper middle class person am completely dependent or hugely dependent on coal mining to provide my electricity uh and so on so i think there is a bigger challenge that we have to con- confront ourselves it's not just without let, trying to be you know trying to let zavadekar off the hook or uh, this dispensation of the hook i mean i was in the coal mining environmental clearance committee and for 3 years it was a punishment posting for me because i saw from inside the system how the even without the new draft ei 2020 the process of giving environmental clearances was manipulated on a daily basis um, you know to make it a completely meaningless process right and i'm so i'm completely uh, with you on this question of uh, what is going on in the environmental sector and it's not just the question of climate and i'm saying that this partly the story of of our uh, uh, the fact that our environmental governance is in shambles partly that we are not we don't even have a development model that can be let's say uh, equitable and yet uh, not hugely coal dependent yeah thank you i thought because we are talking to the teachers who need to translate some of what is happening around to the students we better address some of such issues thank you absolutely absolutely thanks thank you sohas uh, shall there's a yeah. question from manish vinayak um, about the multiple drivers that you clearly pointed out and asking is there a lesson about how to create constituencies for change on these questions in short is this a question of understanding a problem or is it more of an eclectic approach out how to build social power to achieve these multiple outcomes um that is questions of uh, the um the, the, the multiplication of local coalitions to address particular problems um can you see that question can you address that please yeah 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 uh thanks uh anish it's it's a difficult question i don't think i have an easy answer but yes at one level it is about building coalitions right so if the adivasis are basically fighting coal mines or uh, something else a uh, big dam because it's going to destroy their livelihoods um we can empathize with their situation we can also say that it has implications for uh, global climate uh, so there is a win win there between uh, fighting the coal mine on grounds of local uh, livelihood destruction Uh, or violation of human rights uh, loss of biodiversity and climate impacts so and one has to build those coalitions right one has to build those coalitions without assuming that those coalitions will work in every case and i think the challenge for us is sometimes you know they don't line up in this very easy way uh, let's say for example in an urban context it's not about coalitions i mean if i have to reduce my footprint i have to reduce my footprint and there's a little bit of a win win perhaps between saying well reduce your uh, rice consumption shift to ragi that's good for you good for the environment reduces water consumption maybe gives the adivasi a better price for their millets rather than giving uh, prices to, uh, the price to the punjab farmer so there are some again we need to look for those win wins but uh, sometimes it is we just have to face up to the hard reality that uh, you know our whole understanding of development and modernity as to how we would, the lifestyle that we have now even even the indian uh, middle class thinks that is the right lifestyle and that includes me is still a hugely fossil fuel dependent lifestyle and um it, there is no direct win win in the sense i would have to actually willingly i would have to be willing to give up a certain component of this lifestyle that has been for so long drilled into me that that's the right kind of lifestyle to aspire for in fact or multifold uh, notions of that lifestyle as we see through tv and all other media as being practiced in the west right and we are part of that so how do we uh, give it up ourselves i think some one of the biggest challenges so sometimes there going to be really uh, nice coalitions and other times maybe not that's uh, sort of my uh, incomplete answer to you perhaps thank you um there's there's an, an earlier question there too from mayank kumar from, from mayank kumar from so this this question is is about um well you know the key study on air i mean if you since you mentioned uh, that not as a case study but as one of your slides about different categories of consumption and pollution um so if you 
if you could say something more about that, about air pollution. If not, uh, please suggest reading for that. There was also a question about, about uh, Priyanka's question about, um, about forest case study will be presented. We'll talk about that later, Priyanka, but let's just get through this answer. Yes. Uh, sorry, so this is a question from Mayan Kumar. Will it be Fine, possible Kumar, to yeah. discuss, discuss the case study of air, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, let me just say very briefly that my reference to air pollution was just to point out that um, different environmental problems manifest themselves in different ways at different regional or local scales. And some uh, it's good to point out that our carbon footprint sort of cuts to the very heart of moder modernity or modern industrial uh, and fossil based, uh, you know, developmental uh, uh, thinking or developmental styles uh, or lifestyles. But uh, very often, so, so sometimes there's a win win in the sense you could reduce air pollution uh, in ways that also reduces your climate uh, carbon footprint, right. Um, and it's useful to look at that win win. So for example, the, the rich class are also the big emitters of, of um, PM 2.5 and big emitters of, of carbon dioxide. So in a sense, reducing consumption by the rich has a win-win, has a dividend in terms of reduction in both air pollution and, and, and CO2 uh, emission reductions. But uh, the implications of uh, air pollution are regional uh, and complicated. Uh, the implications of CO2 are a little bit easier to understand. They are global. They, you know, everybody benefits from reduced emissions. Here it's more complicated. Sometimes the, uh, you might be benefiting yourself locally. Sometimes you might be actually seeing no benefit at all if the uh, thermal power plant is located far away and the, uh, the plume is going in some completely different direction. So uh, the imp impacts are very different. So that's, I was using air pollution as an example of another kind of environmental impact that will sometimes uh, go hand in hand with CO2 emissions. Sometimes it might not. Okay. So there is, there's, there's another question again from, uh, I mean, specifically about, um, about well, the theme that is monopolization of environmentalism by climate change and climate change dialogues and so on. And what is that doing to environmental governance in India? Uh, this is from Ashwin Shishadri. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ashwin, in a sense, my, uh, my talk and my writing on this question has been triggered uh, by this worry about monopolization of the environmental sector by climate change, um, the climate change discourse, and the fact that you are at the Diveja Center for Climate Change and that's the only sort of policy oriented center in the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, the Center for Ecological Science still think that it's doing basic science. Uh, the, there is no center, well, there's now very recently, uh, much after the Divecha Center was formed, uh, an interdisciplinary center on water, uh, which has vaguely some inclination towards uh, water policy. It just tells us that uh, the money is the big money is in climate change and therefore you can have a big donor who can come and say you guys need to work on climate change and then maybe a, a, ins, a relatively insular or a hugely insular institute like the institute of science will respond to this big donor till then they won't respond so yes absolutely there's been a huge monopolization and uh, the uh, it's forcing everybody to locate you know link their work to climate change so the water forest sector and this is likely a response to somebody else who asked this question about forest sector also uh, the forest sector is again a very classic example of the monopolization. So from a debate about who owns the forest, what climate change considerations do is they tend to shut down that debate because the focus then is, oh, we can have uh, carbon sequestration in forests uh, and we need to sell ourselves, India, as a place where you can have a huge amount of carbon sequestration at very cheap rates. And therefore all the CDM money and all whatever carbon offset money and all this other money should come to India. So we're sort of selling ourselves uh, in that, uh, you know, in that uh, market in some sense as the cheapest place to go for carbon sequestration. And where the sequestration is going to happen is going, into ha going to happen uh, in our forests, uh, trampling over any notion of the rights of local communities because the forest department will say, we have the money and we have the power to impose more eucalyptus plantations or acacia auriculum auriculus formis plantations or other kinds of monocultures on that landscape in the name of sequestering carbon, which we are basically doing it for doing for somebody else. So that's uh, an, an example of again monopolization of an environmental problem by the climate change discourse. And this is a little bit of a response to the uh, to Priyanka, I think, who asked this question about the forest sector. 
Um, sorry, we have um, another question from from um, Ajay Patak, who's uh, who's asked, what would be a progressive development model um, from the energy perspective, um, development, development is environmentalism. Uh, what would be a good model? Ajay, you're taking me into areas which I suspect, and this is true for international negotiations on climate change. It's true for even the question of energy. There are many more people in this room or this e-room who are better qualified to answer your question. So I'm happy if somebody else wants to jump in. Uh, but I will just say that uh, if you read the latest uh, paper by Navroz and, uh, Radhika Khosla and Navroz Dubash in EPW on, again, trying to argue for a multi-criteria approach to uh, decision-making or policy-making in the environmental sector, they are saying the same thing, which is that there are multiple concerns and we should not be energy policy should not be driven only by notions of atmanirbharta not or energy security in this case not driven only by the issue of you know providing enough energy to drive the developmental kind of locomotive uh, or only about uh, or tweaked only by climate change concerns you really need to be looking at uh, the multiplicity of concerns around energy policy uh, the issue of jobs the issue of livelihoods the issue of local emissions in particular air pollution global emissions other kinds of environmental impacts, uh, you know, uh, the risk around uranium, for example, that Ramana has worked on for so many years, uh, nuclear power based uh, thinking in the energy sector. So really, again, trying to make the same argument that there are multiple environmental problems associated with the energy sector, there are multiple developmental angles to the energy sector, it's not just energy drives development in kind of any simplistic way. And uh, energy policy making needs to be much more open and transparent and thinking about integrating these multiple dimensions uh, into uh, policy making. Yeah, um, um, I have a few comments and, and a big, big question too, but um, I'll ask uh, Ramana, are you here? Can you just, he wanted to respond to um, Sharad's response to Navroz if there is time. So I think we will have time. Yes, Ramana, please. Hello. So, uh, yeah, Sharad, this is a discussion we've had a long, long time ago and we continue to I, have that. <laughs> but so, I think, we, um, so what you said, how you captured the recent piece by uh, Radhika and Navroz, I think is quite right that, you know, we are, have to think about a multi-criterion sort of decision-making process. But I think when you go back to the international uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, negotiations, there's a way to capitalize on the fact that you might be deciding on a lower emission strategy compared to earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. and sort of say, look, you know, this is what we bring to Paris and or wherever else we are meeting. And so, you know, you guys in the West, you guys need to do uh, better on that. And I think that's the kind of approach that's been taken. And I think there's a second reason to also think about that because going back to the issue of, you know, Trump walking away from even Paris and all those kinds of problems, how do you deal with that? The only way to deal with that is to try and give something to movements and groups within the United States and within uh, the West uh, in the global north to be able to fight their governments and their uh, you know capitalist lobbies which are sort of pushing for fossil fuels and so on and this is one way i think you can you know groups from across the world can actually try to come together so i wouldn't sort of i, I know that you agree with me in a way but uh, i think you're sort of stating it more strongly than it needs to be said Well, I'll respond to Ramana if I have time, but Raji, I thought yes. you would want to no, table your questions. Yes, please go ahead. No, you, you respond to this and then I'll get so, to my So, group. Ramana, I think my question is, I mean, there's no, no simple answer, but when I've interacted with some groups in the US, it's amazing. It's just absolutely stunning to see how few of them even know the per capita numbers, you know? And therefore, it makes me like, okay, so how much give is enough? How much do you give them before they you know, come around and say, yeah, well, you guys are doing enough and we really need to do more and, and so on. I, I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm beginning to become more and more concerned that we are only giving and not really getting enough, even from the so-called progressive groups in the US. And I said, I, I'm stunned at the number of people uh, who do not have any idea about uh, per capita numbers. So that, that even if they are, you know, progressive, nigh, you know, sort of like-minded people at, at some superficial level, they haven't engaged with these questions or they talk in simplistic terms about, oh, India is overpopulated, China is overpopulated and blah, 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 and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just saying, where do you draw the line? I mean, I agree. It's a, this is a huge problem, but I don't think that the answer to that is to sort of go to the other end. That's all. 
Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's true. There, there, there is, uh, well, this 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 concern about about where we draw the line that's that's always um, haunting us. Um, you know, for for me, I and mean, thanks again for a fascinating lecture, and also thank you everybody for this wonderful questions and and the discussion. Um, I have a, a little a little um, well. Um, again, delighted to see that this, this multiple concerns, dimensions of environmentalism have been brought out and so so brilliantly, I mean, each listed carefully and uh, well thought out. But but for uh, for for um, you know, um, let, let me put it this way: um, I worry about about um, again brilliant that that Amita has this this formulation of development also as an environmentalism. But what to me the the, the worry is that um, you know we still don't don't see development as something that has been really dominated by one discipline and economics. And um, that is where, I mean, look at the entire climate, or oh, let's say carbon trade. Why are we doing carbon trade? Because it comes from one discipline. It comes from one basic construct, right? Again, some of the, um, some of the concerns that we have about, about this environmentalism have to do with, uh, well, what Anish was asking about local coalitions of power, about understanding, about linkages between social and ecological systems and so on. And that is something where none of our policymakers, US, India, China, I mean, and, and nowhere near, near the picture, you know, some small little, let's say a county in Kenya or, you know, uh, uh, some parts of Cuba, I mean, but agriculture, they've made a little headway, but nothing else. So in terms of these multiple uh, environmentalisms, there are smaller communities that have made a headway and uh, we're not learning lessons from them. That's one, one major point. We are, we are, again, of course, the lack of, of the politics and power in this development is environmentalism part, because development plus a big chunk of, of suppression, oppression, and power is environmentalism. So that's that's a big chunk that we need to put in there. The other the other question that I have to you is about um, let's let's imagine we are at the beginning of the industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution. Yeah, um, this whole obsession that we have about uh, technology and finance, and these are the two things that we are all begging for, right? Um, more money and more technology, right? Um, that uh, comes to the industrial revolution itself much later, after two hundred years of institutional change. Yeah, institutional change in terms of banking, insurance, the kind of trade relationships, um, well, uh, political, um, you know, ownership that is out of the church and the, and the king to, you know, ownership by, by various guilds and whatever, whatever. So there's a whole range of institutional changes. And even today, our negotiations are not moving towards these institutions and laws, rules, and norms as based on the structures that we have now in the post-industrial revolution era is where we are still pitching at. Don't you think there should be a case for pitching at the pre-industrial revolution again? Community-based institutions that did exist, not just in Europe, across the world. So there's a question here about the global north and south as creating more problems. Yes, I mean, that divide is creating problems because there are institutions even today in the, in the west and the north, just as we have in, in our tribal communities and so on, which are very robust and, um, well, deal with these relationships as just as uh, multiple dimensions of, of environmentalism. Um, I'm just asking why we can't, or have you come across anybody <laughs> negotiating on these, bringing back some of these institutions? Um, labor commodity principle, for instance. I mean, who says that labor is a commodity? I mean, we created that yeah. as part of the Industrial Revolution. Where are we challenging that? Yeah, I mean, your question about what part of your development, your electricity consumption goes back to some worker well, dying in the mines of Shah Khan is mm -hmm. related because he is just a commodity. Yeah. And that's something that we don't seem to be asking. So our questions of justice are built on some foundation that we imagine was created in the Industrial Revolution. And I think our negotiations, our climate negotiations will never succeed until we get back to some of these, well, questioning and reformulating the institutions, the rules and norms on which this Industrial Revolutions were built all the technological changes, factory systems, so on and so forth were built. Sorry, that's my my throat to the talk. And thank well, you very much. Coming back to this to, last thanks, point thanks, again, Sharad, like sorry. Yeah. yeah, you know, because I mentioned SciSeds precisely because of this, because, because you know, I mean, the, the way in which, uh, well, economics and the social sciences um, are still, well, you know, I mean, UNESCO, for instance, took ages to join the climate change negotiations, right? I mean, to even acknowledge that was a problem. So why are we like this? I mean, we, we need to get get ahead of the problem and uh, not react to the problem. Sorry. 
thanks Shalom. but but actually in in your last sentence um, i think there are there are seeds of what i would like to say which is that if we it, uh, it's uh, we don't have to be, uh, have either or explanations uh, i don't think it is, it is okay to say or it's feasible to say that uh, the institutions of commodification came first and the the energy revolution or the you know technological re- revolution came afterwards and therefore we need to focus on you know uh, only you know so i am not at all saying that we shouldn't be looking at those institutions absolutely uh, whether it is the political institutions or the economic institution uh, you know which creates the idea of commodity so easily but i'm saying even technology is part of that process of creating commodities why do we have commodities because i can now live without having to dirty my hands in growing my own food and a significant fraction of humanity now 20 30 40 50 50 and in the us 90% of the of the uh, of humanity is living without having to grow their own food right and to me that's part and parcel of commodification uh, that you can just buy go to a shop and buy everything that you want is commodification and to say that it is only built upon the social relations that you know uh, i think it's a little bit uh, uh, over simplified i'm not saying the social relations are not important but it's uh, missing the technological component and similarly therefore your last point about uh, unesco and the social sciences and economics i think that points to my other argument which is that um, fragmented thinking within the knowledge systems is part of the problem and it's it's a, a semi independent part of the problem because we are all beneficiaries of of that fragmented thinking also the fact that somebody just sat and worked on electronics and worked on electronics and we have mobile phones at the end of the day or the internet that you and i are using right now to talk to each other uh, is also part of that process and therefore i am worried about saying that we can go back to that some kind of a pre industrial past we can learn from bits and pieces of it but it's much going to be much more difficult to uh, uh, you know undo this stuff and go backwards and so to me the so for me the really difficult question and i i don't have any answer is how do we think about adivasi communities let us assume for a moment and i have serious doubts about to what extent you had uh, no patriarchy no casteism in adivasi communities i mean i see that patriarchy and community in casteism all the time when i interact with the forest uh, rights groups or the adivasis living in forest uh, but assume for a moment that they had better institutions quote unquote more progressive Uh, uh social institutions the question for me is how can we uh, think about such institutions in the modern context where you do still want some electricity you still do want something else you still want to use some amount of plastic or whatever else that uh, is the product of this technological revolution we can't turn the clock back so the question for me really is what's the smart way of going forward and i don't have any answers but i'm saying that in that movement forward we will have to re uh, uh, we would still have to deal with technology as it is today and whatever it has given and whatever it has taken away right whatever it has destroyed that's part of the story and there's no real going back is what i'm saying uh, and therefore the fragmentation of our thinking we need to be working on that and that includes this fragmentation of institutional uh, social institutions and technological change and how do we think of them together i think it's is part of our challenge Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really saying that we should go back to um, anything. I'm just saying that our our ability to see technologies as part of a larger social construction, and also, I mean, our entire financial system now, I mean, from from real economy to a completely, completely virtual economy, we're all like string I and mean, puppets on a string, kind of, uh, you know, dancing to the tune of some some virtual derivatives trading or whatever that's happening, yeah. right? So, yeah, I mean. Yeah. we need to shake off those and um, and the way to do that is to is to at least you know well start picking at the at these fundamental institutions that built the industrial revolution or led to the industrial revolution again uh, are tribal communities the answer maybe not i mean but there are answers in various communities and there is i mean as beblin says the institutions that we have today are already outdated yeah so there is hope there is hope that we will change the institutions and we've always done that so again bolding's talk about information which is something that just taught about is there is there uh, entropy in, in information yes there is and perhaps but then there is always a resistance to change that that information brings to the social structure to the powers 
So there will be resistance, but I think there is a, that to put institutions or institutional and technological change together on the same footing um, will perhaps give us a much clearer picture of the problem than, um, than well, saying that technologies will <laughs> so, I'm, well, I'm, I, hope is, is, I mean, I don't know if I don't know why I might have given you the impression that I'm being a technological determinist because I had six <laughs> things in my pic in that picture of which technology was one. So. <laughs> You do, yes. Okay. yes. So if there are no other questions, if there's uh, anything that um, that anybody wants to ask is an absolutely urgent question, um, we can take that. Um, um, oh, okay. Mayank saying that he has reservations with respect to pre-industrial era institutions as better option. Um, well, it's not that those are better options. I mean, that there are lessons about some of these pre-industrial, well, era revolution, or let's say, uh, Industrial Revolution changed some of these basic institutions, and uh, what we can reclaim now as um, as better. Um, yeah, is there time for change? Um, is something that's come just now. So, if there's a quick question uh, that you can take, Walter, do you want to elaborate on that? I don't know. Is there time? That is, is the urgency question probably that the urgency to act immediately? It's... Yeah, uh, maybe you can come in, Walter. Yeah. 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 So I've come in. Uh, do we time to change because actually what I understand is the time for, first of all, I consider climate change just to be the last straw that broke the camel's back. So I agree that it's not uh, the end all and be all in mind question that we have. But do we have time for everything that we have? The international negotiations are going nowhere. And therefore we are just like lemmings going into the sea. So do we have time? to change or do we have to do, think of something else for instance we have, have an, no i'm curious well I, I think walter is heading towards something so you might as well say what else would you do i mean let's actually assume we don't that, have permission. yeah i mean uh, just as you said i i can only frame the question i don't have the answer except to live the way we can live away from it all because more actually cooperating with the system and not enough of us are opting out of the system, which will only, that's the only possibility to bring in uh, institutional change. And therefore we have a stake in the system because we have no other way to be comfortable with what we are, including, I'm talking about myself. I'm not putting myself somewhere else in the whole place. So. But uh, Walter, I would also add that maybe there's another way, which is I think what Anish was getting at, which is the idea of building coalitions. And I think, for instance, the idea that even today, uh, the the reason, one of the ways in which we could tone down the rate at which we are, let's say, extracting coal or building dams or whatever, is if we had a more democratic governance over natural resources, right? And then we have some tools for that. We have the Forest Rights Act. We've had the Panchayat Tiraj extension to scheduled areas. There are the Northeast actually has its own sort of six schedule kind of protection. Uh, maybe just the tail and we are trying to use the tail to wag the dog, but we just have to look for multiple tails. I mean, this is a huge dog. So uh, actually, Sharad, it was not a question. Yeah. Actually, it but was not a question for you. Fair it was not fair really fair. a question for you. I just wanted to frame that question because we have to think differently as to what we are going to do, because even building coalitions, we've always wanted workers of the world to unite. It's about 150 years since that was written. And we don't get together. And the space for getting together is even less now. So we're being squeezed on many fronts. And therefore, I was not asking you that question. I was just asking myself and in general, how do we in this place where there's no time talk about change, talk about climate change, talk because it's not just climate. All parameters on the, uh, you know, most natural cycles are going into the negative. And is there space to bring them back technologically as well as our social capital and our social organization and the institutions we have are just fraying and we are not actually getting anywhere. That was what I was meaning. But anyway, I'm not seeking an answer from you or anybody else. It's a question that I have for myself. Actually. Because I teach living with climate change and sometimes I wonder what am I saying? <laughs> That's all. Let, let me just say that we don't have the luxury of giving up hope. Yeah. Uh, that I don't. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you both. Thanks, Sharad. And um, Nagraj, can, can we just wind up now or up? Yeah, please, please. There's a message from uh, Raj Kishore Jha about an experiment that they're doing on um, on a river revival in Varanasi. So that's another message that we have. Otherwise, um, I get. I guess we are out of time. Nagraj, can we wind up now? Is it Anish? Yeah, please. Okay, so over to you, and um, we're um, extremely grateful to to Mr. Sharad Lele for this for this lecture and for this to all of you for this great discussion. Uh, do join us at our next um, lecture. Um, we will keep you posted on this on WhatsApp and on email. Um, and also, please take a look at our our website, and we also have a Twitter handle. Uh, so please take a look at all this. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to add that Sharad Lele's essay in the new review has been put up on our on the teachers group wordpress site so those interested and i would urge you to all of you to read that essay those who have not it is extremely rich and those are fascinating questions so it's up there on our wordpress site already thanks to new left review and thank you for that Sharad. and once again Sharad, thank you very much for such a rich discussion and presentation today really. thank you thanks thank, thank you raji and naga for uh, having me as part of this discussion i hope we can continue the discussion and sharing in multiple ways. I look yeah, forward to it. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you all for joining me.